The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right, folks, uh, let's get started then. Uh, welcome to Current Topics today. Uh, we're going to continue the discussion of how to conduct research in HCI, and we're going to take a look at um, how experimental research is done in detail, and uh, then we're going to move from this whole, like, how you do your research to how you publish your research. So um, uh, what we covered last time, um, which unfortunately you had to watch on video because I was uh, out sick, um, it was the uh, question on how you manipulate variables, right? And you change certain variables and you measure certain other variables. So there was the discussion of independent variables, how you create treatment conditions, um, also between groups, within group design was discussed at length. Um, so. Uh, and the other topic that was covered in the last class um, online was counterbalancing and Latin square arrangements for uh, saving yourself a bit of um, treatment conditions and numbers of different conditions that you would otherwise have to go through. Um, if you haven't seen those, please do go back and, and watch those videos. Um, it's important to, to get that right because these are things that will come up again and again. Every time you do any kind of HCI research, whether it's maybe you know, in your thesis or something like that, or in your own uh, project that you're doing, uh, you will have to answer those questions. So this is some basic stuff that uh, you should be aware of. Um, we also um, covered the, uh, these different scales of measurement already. Um, again, these are important to understand because you need to know what kind of scale uh, your uh, variables are on in order to decide which test you use, which statistics test you pick to uh, test your results. So next up, we're going to talk about um, this question of actually measuring the variables. Like, how, what does it mean when variables um, get count when you get confounding variables, or what are extraneous variables, and and what can we do to control our variables better? So. Um, the name of independent variable is a little confusing, right? Because it sounds like independent, oh, I can do whatever I want, but actually that's the one that you hold on to, that you go uh, ahead and uh, control, right? So this is the one that you manipulate um, in a controlled fashion. So if you want to test something with two different kind of input devices, the type of input device is the variable that you're controlling, right? It has two separate values. By the way, anybody seen the, the stuff from last time? Um, would you know what if you had like, let's say you test something with a keyboard input and a mouse input. Let's say you want to do a study with those two input devices comparing each other. What kind of variable scale would that be? Anybody been able to catch up on that on, on the video already? What kind of scale would that be on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, should be even keyboard types would be the Independent variables, and yeah. independent variables you could measure like timing speed, accuracy, force. Absolutely right. Yep. So th these are the independent variables. Uh, I was actually wondering about this, like what kind of scale? Right. No, that's all right. You, you weren't wrong, right? It's just I was looking. This is something that's a little tricky sometimes to figure out. Uh, what kind of scale would that be? If you had two different uh, types of devices. Like, so for tolerance. Of Falls, for example, would be ratio because there's zero value and then zero falls, I guess. Okay, so for the dependent variables, yes, yes. If you have like number of errors that people make, there is an absolute zero, so you can actually yeah, ratio. Ratio. Exactly. So that's something that you guys should just, you know, know like that because this is super important to figure out. Um, and a lot of people don't figure these out correctly, especially once you get to uh, the interval and ratio things. Things get a little hairy, so read the definitions carefully again and go over the materials that we gave you guys last week uh, to figure out exactly what it is, because otherwise your statistical tests are going to be wrong. Anyway, so we are, the independent variables uh, would be, you know, for example, the, the input device type could be one, uh, which would be nominal, as you say. Um, and dependent variables are the ones that we're watching. Right? Uh, those are the ones that depend on the independent ones, right? Or at least we think that they depend on them. That's kind of what we're trying to show, right? Um, <clears throat> so we 
look at those uh, for any changes that happen. Um, and those are not the only variables, though, that we have. There's lots of others. All the others you could call, first of all, extraneous variables, meaning, in principle, we're not interested in them. Unfortunately, just not being interested in them doesn't mean that they can't mess up your, your study. Right? They can still uh, influence your results in ways that make your results invalid. And if that happens, uh, then you have a confounding variable. Um, so to give an ex example, theoretically you could say, you know, you got two user groups and a couple people have green shirts and the others are wearing blue shirts. And you know, that could be an extraneous variable, but eh, the influence on, you know, performance is probably not very big. Um, but if it's a confounding variable, then that's, a, that's one where, that actually changes in a systematic way, right? that changes along with the independent and dependent variables in some way. Note that we're not saying that it causes anything here, right? We're not claiming cause, but it could be an alternative explanation of how the two variables, the independent and the dependent ones, are actually um, related. And so, uh, and those are the ones that we need to identify, and somehow we need to find countermeasures against that. Otherwise, we can't actually do the controlled experiment that we're trying to do. So how do we deal with those? Um, some examples for those kinds of extraneous variables that can or cannot become confounding um, are like age, for example, of users. Um, a lot of people think that age is like one of the big discriminators. It turns out it's actually eh, you know, less important than you might think. Uh, personal differences tend to overshadow these, uh, these age effects. Um, but level of expertise is another one. Right? Again, if I'm just asking people to click on a, on a target on the screen, then doesn't really matter what kind of level of expertise they have in using a particular application, but in other situations, this could very well be a confounding variable. So what kind of options do we have uh, to, to deal with this? What would you do if, if you had to set up your experiment and you wanted to, for example, let's say you want to control the variable level of expertise better. You want to make sure that it doesn't become a confounding variable. What could you do? Ideas? Yeah. Maybe ask for a little survey before you start things about like their level of expertise in regards to like a particular skill or how much they've used. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's an interesting one because that you would have to do to first even know about the variable. Right. So you're right. If you don't even ask about this, then you have no idea whether in the end the people with lots of expertise maybe did differently. But even if you ask about it that still hasn't turned off the effect that it could have, right? You could still say, okay, I know what kind of level of expertise everybody had. And, and what you're suggesting is actually one way to solve it, going towards that way, which is you're basically making it an extra independent variable, right? You're saying like, I'm gonna actually use age as well as one of the things I want to control. It sounds like an easy way out. Why could that be difficult though? What could be a problem if you say, okay, I'm not going to use level expertise, let's just use that uh, as another independent variable? Uh, if you do a group study, you would even need more participants. Right, you need more people, right? Um, because now you have another variable for which you need enough data to make any you know, meaningful uh, statements about its impact or non impact that it has. So that tends to complicate your experiment if you include another independent variable. Usually you have a combinatorial explosion of combinations now of, uh, you know, cases that you need to test. And, and each treatment, as we say, is like, you know, for each independent variable, we pick one value, right? And all those values together make up one treatment. And now if you add another independent variable, you've just added another dimension to your space of independent variables. So it can blow up your experiment um, just you know, number of user-wise and number of conditions-wise. Um, any other ideas what you could do? Again, let's stick with level of expertise. So I don't want to make it a controlled, you know, another, another independent variable. Yeah. I mean, you could try to get people with a similar level of expertise. Right. right. I'm just going to test with you know people who I don't know are all computer science students with lots of experience in programming, and then I let them test these two input devices, right? So then you've kind of nailed this down a little bit. 
that's that's another option. Um, could you think of another way to do this? That would also be picking a particular value. That would also basically hold the level of expertise constant, right, at a very low level, right? So it's similar to what 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 you suggested, um, but sort of the the way that you actually end up dealing with most of these variables is you basically just distribute at random and you hope that the effects cancel themselves out. Right? So um, if you if you toss it across these different uh, conditions that you have and you say I'm going to put some experienced people in this group and some unexperienced people in this group, um, then if the effect isn't overshadowing your main effect that you're trying to measure, then you should be good. So these are actually the options that we have, right? We can hold a constant, which is what you guys were suggesting. I'd like all participants to have the same kind of value for that experience variable. Or um, you make a matching where you say, okay, I'm actually going to make this an independent variable and I'm going to tie down, um, you know, I'm going to pick 10 people who are not, not low level expertise, medium expertise, whatever, high expertise, and I'm going to pick uh, a number of participants in each group so that we have roughly balanced sizes of these subgroups. And so you're basically turning uh, you're creating another independent variable, or randomly assign people and hope for the best. So that's the um, that's actually what you end up having to do with most of these things because these other two are often just um, not practical. All right. So um, we've now understood a little bit more about like extraneous variables in general, which are variables that we you know ignore. Uh, and confounding variables that actually have an impact that we need to somehow, we need to resolve for. And since you can't really know about this ahead of time, you basically, it's, it's wise to err on the side of caution and just to say any extraneous variable that I come across, I will consciously decide how I'm gonna deal with this. And usually it means randomly assign across conditions um, or maybe one of the other two options that you have so that you can be sure that they don't turn into something that messes up your experiment. Okay, so next up is the question of validity, internal and external validity. Um, the first thing is internal validity, and these two are actually sort of almost um, a trade-off in most cases. Um, so you can have more or less internal validity, and that will actually influence your external validity um, in the opposite way. So internal validity means I can actually create a single unambiguous explanation for the relationship between two variables. Um, in, in layman's terms, you could say internal validity means you set up your experiment right. right? You say it very bluntly, very simply. Um, some examples of what could threaten this internal validity is uh, confounding variables, like we just saw, right? If you have something like that in the mix, um, or experimenter bias. Remember from BIS one when we said, like, when you go out and ask users about, you know, which of the systems would you prefer, you don't go and tell them, oh, do you like, you know, this standard industry software, or do you prefer this software that I wrote, which is the biggest idea I ever had, and that I spent my last year of my life writing. Right? You don't influence people that way. And the same is true for any any uh, experiment, right? Experimenter bias can actually have a fairly strong impact, so you need to be very careful that you take yourself out of the equation and don't uh, look at results with, you know, through tinted glasses, so to say. Next up, we've got learning effects. Also something um, that you're probably already aware of, right? People, as they go through um, different conditions, might actually learn something about the task so that they get better as the conditions move on. Or the opposite, right? Fatigue effects exist as well, right? Where people are like, oh my God, I've done this like 15 times now, and they get like worse all the time. So all kinds of options here. And um, another one is that just being observed causes uh, the changes. Right? For example, if you ask people to, I don't know, process their email inbox, right? Um, while you are looking over their shoulder, watching them and recording it on video, et cetera, right? And recording the audio and their facial expression. That can very well influence the way that they do this um, and change it from their normal behavior when they're unobserved. So, uh, these are all things that can threaten your internal validity. So let's say you do a study, 
you write it all up, you submit a paper, you know, in Kai, and uh, the reviewers come back, then you know you might well find a reviewer saying like, hmm, I think you know the way that this experiment was conducted actually suggests that there was a learning effect between these conditions because people were doing you know they had to I don't know type the same sentence with five different keywords so by the fifth keyword they knew the sentence by heart and you know so they've gotten faster and that can basically then mean that your paper gets rejected because the internal validity of your study isn't there so even though you found something in your data your statistics all worked out somebody can basically say Ooh, there's a hole in your argument uh, you made a mistake there so that you can't claim what you're trying to claim uh, based on the, the on the reasons that you say um, caused these things. Could it have been a learning effect? The other one is, of course, external validity. And external validity means, um, let's say I've got you know five different keyboards and I test them with everybody here in the room, right? So uh, it's a within groups. Everybody gets to use all five different keywords. I make sure that there are no internal validity issues. I try to address all these. And then I say, oh, and clearly because of what we found, uh, this is the best keyword for like everybody. Could be true, could not be true. It depends on what you're exactly claiming. But in general, if you, if you generalize your results beyond the group that you tested with, you have to have a very good case in point that this generalization is, is solid. Um, so with typing on a keyboard, you might be able to argue, yeah, that's probably going to apply for a larger group of people. On the other hand, uh, let's say I let you guys all write um, you know, program code that has lots of backslashes and square brackets and whatnot in there. Uh, and we find, you know, surprisingly, that the US keyboard is faster because these keys are really easy to reach on the US keyboard and not so much on the German one. And then you say, so that's why everybody should be using US keywords all the time, even when they are typing letters in, you know, in, in, uh, in a secretary job. Um, then that might not be a valid uh, generalization. So um, external validity means how far can we um, extend our results to other groups of users, other demographics, um, other settings, right? Just because I find that uh, one system works better than the other. Um, in a lab setting on a table, you know, with no disturbances, uh, might not be that this is actually true when people use the same uh, two, let's say, apps or so on the go while they're waiting for the bus or crossing the street or whatnot. Um, so we just to have to make sure that we don't overclaim what we found. Right? We have to make sure we've shown that this is true for the following thing, and we think this can generalize to the following other situations for the following reasons. Uh, but also be uh, open, and that's why you often find the limitation section in the paper that says, ah, we only tested with, you know, like 20-something year olds from computer science, and so, eh, you know, be careful applying this to other demographics. Um, so that's something we need to avoid, like the generalization across participants. Um, another one that can also be a little trickier to detect is if multiple independent variables were actually interfering with, you, with each other. We'll get back to that a little when we talk about the different testing um, mechanisms that we have, where you can actually then also um, examine whether a combination of two independent variables is maybe the cause for an effect, uh, rather than just one variable causing um, everything that's going on. Um, so that could mean like, you know, I found that, I don't know, the, um, Keyboard one was better than keyboard two, uh, but only if the room was really well lit, you know, because maybe the writing on that one keyboard is actually kind of hard to make out, but the arrangement is better. So you know, in, in dark condition, actually, that is no longer true. So then you have a combination saying, yeah, if you use keyboard one and it's bright, two independent variables, right? The combination of that makes for faster type. So as I said in, initially here, talking about ability, this is usually a trade-off. Right? So, meaning if you nail everything down, you create a very sort of controlled environment where everything is, uh, you know, constant. You've got everybody with the same level of expertise, whatnot. Like demographics are very slim. You can make a very valid study in terms of internal validity. 
but as you can see from what I just described, it also means that it's not very generalizable. Okay? The more you try to get a more general result that applies across a wider range of people, a wider range of contexts, etc., the harder it becomes to keep your internal validity up. Um, so that's often a uh, design choice that you make as a researcher when you say like, well, okay, what is it that I want to show? Maybe you want to, I don't know, start with just showing that, you know, this one technique that you develop works better than everything else in a very controlled lab study. And then once you found that works, then you can go out and maybe do a more um, environmentally uh, or, or ecologically valid, as we sometimes say, uh, study that covers a wider range of uses contexts. To give you an example, um, for quite a few years now, uh, the community in, in mobile research, like that looks at any kind of mobile HCI research question, has pretty much agreed that studies that say something about, let's say, an input technique of a mobile device are no longer acceptable if they only study people sitting down with the device in their hand. Because you know, when you have a mobile device, what do you do? You stand, you walk around, right? Um, and you look somewhere else, you conf you're, you're distracted, you know, you know, your body is moving. So uh, any input techniques need to take that into account. So these days, usually uh, studies that talk about input techniques on mobile devices have to include a, a walking and standing uh, uh, condition as well. And that's an example of the community trying to make their results more ecologically or, or externally valid. All right. Um, we said earlier that we can take extraneous variables and include them as independent ones, but that leads to lots of experiment conditions. Uh, we said we can leave them as random, meaning uh, we are basically just saying that's what, what the actual natural use also leads to, a system that's used by different people in different environments, etc. Um, so that means the external validity goes up, right? We say, well, we tested this with people of all ages, of all levels of expertise, just as in the real population where you have a different uh, distribution of these things. Um, or you can try to control them, which then brings your um, confidence in your results up, uh, meaning like I only tested this with people of the following level of expertise in the following setting, only sitting down, uh, and only with, I don't know, people in the age of 20 to 25 or something. Then your internal validity goes up, but you know, the external one obviously goes down. So uh, this is what I meant with you know that this is usually a a trade-off between these two two sides. All right. So that basically means we've now uh, covered validity of your findings, how you uh, deal with this, and um, how you actually do the comparison between variables, how you actually do the statistics. Uh, will be a topic in our statistics heavy lecture next week. So yay, come to the lecture next week. It's going to be about statistics. It's going to be really awesome. Um, well, I'm hoping that we can actually share that, you know, yeah, statistics actually has a pretty important use in actually, you know, moving research knowledge of the world of, of humanity forward. Right? That you need to run these things in order to make claims that other people can pick up with confidence. Okay, so now um, we're actually going to go to um, a topic that comes after you've done your research work or as you're wrapping it up. Um, let's say you're writing your master's or bachelor's thesis with us um, and, uh, you know, you find, huh, this, you know, you and, and the, the PhD student you've been working with and myself, we find, huh, this is actually pretty cool stuff. We found something interesting here. It worked out. The study you ran gave us promising results. We have maybe a new input technique that's interesting that outperforms other techniques under certain conditions. Let's write a paper. Right? So we get to publishing HCI research. Um, and um, what we're going to do in the rest of the, uh, the class today is going to talk about how you do publish your research. How do you get your stuff out there because uh, this is how researchers communicate right uh, we tend not to communicate in Twitter posts or in, in YouTube comments or Facebook reactions or likes uh, when we communicate we tend to 
write everything up in a way that others can really verify what we're saying and go through and then make up their own mind whether they want to trust these results based on the data that we give them or not. Right? This, is, this is our channel of communication, these papers, uh, research articles. And uh, while the, the nature of publishing continues to change as technology advances, right? It used to be that folks would you know, have this one conference a year or this one journal a year that appeared um, and they would send the stuff there. Nowadays, we've got multiple conferences happening over the year. People are pre-print pre archive things. Um, you know, other formats are being tried out. But the fundamental rules of how you can advance the, the knowledge in the scientific field still remain right here. Stuff that you write down has to be something that I can pick up, I can read, I can see what kind of methods you use to arrive at your claims, and I can verify whether I can trust these results. That's how it works. And so that's what publishing HCI research is all about. Um, and, and to start with, I wanted to remind you of something that we uh, said when we looked at the different kinds of research. Remember, we talked about like experimental research um, and um, you know, that we sometimes only observe, that we sometimes measure, et cetera. And the messy truth uh, that was kind of like the, um, the, the, the sort of the culmination of all this is that actual research often happens like this. Yeah? To, so you, have a, you make an observation, right? um, again, using this example, like, huh, I find I, this is an interesting movement to maybe control input on a, you know, on a wearable, uh, on a, on a t-shirt, just rolling my, the cloth between my fingers. Uh, so that's an observation. You think about some scientific theories on how you could uh, con construct a research question around this. Then you build a prototype. If the prototype doesn't work, you build another one. Uh, it starts to work sort of so that informally you feel like, yeah, I think this is now, it's, it's getting somewhere, right? This is, this is okay. Um, then maybe you do, um, you know, a real world study, right? So, so you actually um, give this thing to people and you ask them to use it and you observe how they perform. Um, and you start maybe building a, a simple descriptive model. For example, uh, where on the body do people like to have this kind of thing? Remember the, the pinstripe paper that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then maybe from there on, you build some more prototypes and you advance your research further. You ask more deeper questions. You find that maybe, I don't know, the control that people have with two fingers rolling this uh, depends a lot on the, the type of cloth. So you start exploring different types of cloth and how that influences the controllability of this input device. Um, and so ultimately then, uh, maybe you end up with something that is actually uh, pretty robust. Maybe you find a, you know, a startup or something that wants to try this out or um, or manufacturer, like we, for example, we've worked together with um, uh, industrial uh, knitting, embroidering, and, and, and sewing companies in some of the textile interfaces that we've built. Um, and uh, you then maybe do a long-term sort of study, right? You put this thing into people's hands and let them use it for like a month, or I've seen studies that run for like a year and longer sometimes. Um, and that gives you then uh, much deeper insight into how this thing works and what it actually does. And maybe in the end, you can actually start coming up with a predictive model saying that um, you know, based on the following, I don't know, I'm making this up now, right? Uh, we didn't go that far with this particular research. Uh, yarn qualities or something, you end up finding uh, you know, the following yarn parameters will likely lead to the following uh, effects for the input device that we use. Right? And then people can actually say, oh, I've got a new material that I want to try this with. Uh, and then maybe it, they can look at your model and already predict how it will perform as an input device without having to build it. Right? That's, the, that's, that's a really cool result. Um, so the, the methods that we use um, will really depend on the situation, right? And you often mix and match these kinds of things. Um, also, when you have, uh, you know, when you think about the full picture on how you do your research, you typically end up, you know, reading related work, of course. You run your own studies, and that's all the area of conducting HDR research. That's kind of what we've done uh, so far, right? We've done research contribution types, remember the, the Wobrock paper. Uh, we've gone through briefly how to read a scientific paper, how to draw things out. That's about building your body of knowledge here. And uh, uh, drawing out contribution benefit statements is also about um, this um, you know, reading related work. And we've talked about at length now uh, about research approaches, empirical, um, you know, etc. Um, and you know, so now we're getting to 
writing a paper, um, that paper doesn't just get published once you send it in. It needs to be reviewed, whether it's solid. Uh, and that's a fairly selective process. Some conferences, yeah, Paul is smiling because he knows how painful it is um, uh, to write papers. And then sometimes they get accepted, sometimes they don't. Right? Um, and uh, you know, in the end, you end up with a publication. When the, when the peer group of, of, of your academic peers around the world is, is happy with what you did. And so that's what we're going to be talking about at the end. And then, as I said, this is basically means at this point, you've created this, right? And that goes into back into the body of knowledge that other people can then build on. So that's our community's um, cycle of, of getting to stuff. So that's what we're going to look at next. What are criteria for a good paper? Um, how do you uh, read a paper? How do you, where do you find what? Uh, we're going to use one example paper, and I'm going to show you where the different kinds of things are actually hidden or, 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 or stashed away in, inside the paper on, on each page. Um, and we're going to also look briefly at a, a review, uh, how that typically works. Like what does a review of a paper look like? So how does this process actually uh, generate um, results? Let's start with the, uh, the criteria for a good paper. Um, the most important, what do you think is the most important criterion for a good paper? Yeah, if it's an empirical one, reproducibility. Ah. Um, it's certainly important, I totally agree. Although I could write a paper um, uh, that sort of proves that snow melts at, I don't know, you know, zero degrees. You can reproduce this like super reliably. Something's missing, missing though, right? Um, yeah, Jane. Uh, maybe what's like the new thing this paper brings to the topic? Yes, yes. So, so the the contribution, as we say, right? And so remember that was why why Warbrock's paper was called you know co contribution types because this is typically the core thing that you look for, right? What is the new insight? Uh, that this thing brings to the field. And um, you're absolutely right though with you know, things like reproducibility, uh, which, which is summarized under, under validity, like is, can I pick up the results with confidence? Um, these are all important and if any of those are broken, then the contribution doesn't carry, right? But um, if you don't have an interesting thing to report, then you can write you know, the best paper in the world. It's never gonna get accepted because it's just not interesting, it's boring, right? Uh, and it's surprising, I actually saw this. Um, I was super surprised um, a couple years ago, this started, that I began to saw papers being submitted to Guy and WIST and those kinds of conferences that actually went through all the right moves, right? They had their statistics right, they had their description of the experiment right, and everything was there, but what they were doing was just really not interesting, right? It was it was missing this original spark of an, of an insightful idea or, or a really challenging question that would really move us forward, right? Um, and then you're like, yeah, it's, it's going through all the right moves, but you know, it's still, it, it's not relevant enough. It's not giving enough new findings to the field. So um, the contribution is the most important uh, criterion of all of those. Uh, we're, we're pulling these, by the way, uh, directly from like the submission guides to to next year's Kai, right? So this is we're not making this stuff up. Um, and closely related to that, remember the contribution and benefit statement, right? Is the benefit, right? So uh, what can the community actually do with this? How does this actually benefit the HCI research community? So you could send in a uh, in a paper to Kai uh, that found out something amazing about the the love life of you know, the, the common ant, uh, and everything could be super solid, but then you ask them like, yeah, so what are we gonna do with this in HCI, right? And so this is, this is an interesting question because that often brings up the question of what is HCI? So for example, for the last mm, roughly 10 years or so, we've seen papers about digital fabrication really ramping up, and it's now become a whole section of HCI. You could ask like, what does a paper that tells me how to improve, you know, the way that laser cut P 
pieces are, can fit together. How, the, how is this HCI? But the community has sort of settled on the fact that yes, this makes it possible to create research prototypes quickly. These new machines, this digital fabrication needs good user interfaces and that's what this research is about. So yes, it is very valid inside the community. And so this argument, but this argument has been had, right? People have discussed this. Is this really um, inside our field or too far out there? And then we get to novelty, which is, um, sounds like the same like as the contribution, but a novelty focus is just mostly on the question of, um, you might be you know, publishing a paper that says, oh, I actually found that you know, this Dvorak keyboard layout is actually faster when people practice on it for a while than the QWERTY layout on, on your average keyboard. And everybody's like, whoa, mind blown, but unfortunately, that exactly has been shown you know, many years ago already. People know this. So um, your contribution could be good. It could be potentially very beneficial to the community, but it's not new. Right? So that's, and this is super tricky to actually verify 100%. You can't. Right? It's like you know, trying to prove that God doesn't exist or something. You can only go so far. So what typically the authors do is that the authors ask themselves, to tell you in the paper, in the section related work, what are their closest competitors? Like what are their toughest competitors in terms of their own research? And if I read a related work section and I can see that it covers you know, old papers, recent papers, it covers the conferences and, and journals that I have in mind that people should be looking at for related work, and it brings up all the, re uh, uh, the related work that I remember from like seeing myself, because usually when you're a reviewer, you tend to be an expert in the field, hopefully, that the paper is about. Um, so then I'm, I'm beginning to think, okay, that person has actually read through all the related stuff and has covered their bases. Nevertheless, usually what a good reviewer will do is they will do their own mini related work search, right? They will say, huh, let me type in a couple keywords here and see what you know pops up in the ASIM Digital Library and the IEEE Library, and see if anything comes up that is very, that sounds highly related to this, possibly even the same research result that these guys are trying to publish, um, and it's not listed as related work. And if that appears, then uh, the the novelty uh, question um, goes down. You could actually cover all the prior related work well and in the end report your own findings and the reviewers might still say, you know, yes, you've reported on all the related work that's out there, uh, but we have to say that what you are adding to this is actually too small in terms of what's already known. So um, that could happen uh, to you as well. So just reporting all the related work doesn't automatically make your work novel. Right? Um, if somebody else has done something very related, um, then you'll have to um, explain very clearly why your work is actually adding something important to the body of knowledge. That's why usually when you find related work and it's written well, what you'll find is that somebody says, uh, okay, so I developed this, I don't know, touch uh, technique for mobile devices, and here's another paper that also developed a, rela a similar touch technique, and this is what they did, this was their key contribution, and this is why my work is still different, right? So both honoring the contribution that the other paper does, but also explaining clearly to the reader why it's still important to look at the work in front of them, right? Why the current paper is still adding something to it. That's a good way to write related work. Um, then validity, okay, we just talked about this at length, right? So are the claims that you make backed up properly? And this doesn't just relate to your key research finding, right? When you say like, I developed this new input technique and uh, this is, you know, it, it's better than all the others out there. That's your key thing. But even when you start your paper and you try to motivate why the work that you do is important, etc., cetera, um, don't fall into the trap of making um, unsubstantiated claims. Right? So it's very easy as an author to get carried away and saying like, you know, oh my God, textile interfaces are like the best thing ever and everybody is, everybody wants to buy them right now and then we're all waiting for textile interfaces. And then the reviewer will say like, well, you say so, but can you prove it, right? And if you do that early in your paper, in the introduction, the motivation, um, then you're immediately 
making viewers nervous, right? Because, oh, that author is claiming things without backing them up. So let's see how the rest goes. But you've created, you know, a certain little, uh, you know, tiny voice on the shoulder of that reviewer saying like, hmm, I don't know whether that person knows what they're talking about. And then there's the applicability, which I think is closely related to, to benefits. Uh, how, does, how well does it match the audience? Um, you may have a paper that is about HCI, but it got sent to mobile HCI, but it's about a desktop-based system. So probably the wrong context, right? So um, it's, it's related to this, uh, the, the, the benefits uh, consideration. And then finally, um, you just have to do a really good job of writing things down and, and doing your, you know, graphical explanations, diagrams, etc. cetera. Um, so your paper has to be very readable. Uh, it has to be consistent in your writing. Um, your writing has to be clear. Um, your figures, your text, your graphs have to be error-free. And that sounds like, you know, uh, duh, right? You would be surprised at how many people send in papers that are full of typing mistakes, which you could say, well, that doesn't reduce the scientific contribution, does it? No, it doesn't, but it means that the re reviewer now has to do extra work to decipher what the authors are really trying to say uh, by you know, decoding their messed up writing. Um, and that has a couple problems. The first problem is uh, very egotistically from the author's point of view, uh, you are lowering your chances because you're annoying your reviewers, right? By having to read through a paper that's full of mistakes or badly formatted text or uh, graphs that nobody can read, stuff like this. Um, so it's an unnecessary uh, alienation of your of your reviewers and your readers if the paper's not accepted and your readers also struggle with it. And the second thing is um, it's actually sort of wasting your colleagues' time, right? So um, the way that research works as a, as a worldwide community effort is that one person or one lab does some research and then they actually take up a lot of time from their colleagues around the world who need to review that work. Right? Um, think about, I mean, yeah, we send in you know, a paper to Kai, so what happens to that paper? Uh, there's probably two re reviewers reading this and there's two uh, people in a committee that are coordinating multiple submissions, like a dozen or so, who also need to read this. Then this gets discussed at a program committee meeting. If there's a, if it's not clear whether it should get accepted or not, another reviewer gets brought in. So now we're talking about like you know five people who have each devoted hmm, a day, two days, to actually going through your work. So you've burned a lot of time um, of the global research community. Um, going through your work. So there's no reason why you shouldn't do the best possible job in uh, polishing your presentation, your, your, your submission, so that it's as easy as possible for people to process and doesn't create any friction on the colleagues. It's just, you know, um, also a matter of politeness, I think, and of respect to the reviewer community. Um, so uh, I was just talking to, to Paul. Um, if you want to talk to somebody who's been in the trenches, um, worked on two papers, right, uh, on dark interface, <laughs> yeah, two topics, <laughs> uh, dark user interface patterns um, and uh, the fabric faces system on, on building objects that are fabric covered 3D prints. Um, and uh, you can report about both the successful and the not so successful submission and review process um, of those. So uh, this stuff is real, right? Okay, so now uh, we're going to go and take a paper, uh, and uh, don't worry if, if you can't read all the small text and print. That's not the point, right? I want want to give you a feel for the lay of the land when you go through a paper, right? A typical paper in our field might be eight, ten, you know, twelve double column pages um, in like fairly small print, so it's fairly uh, fairly dense material. Um, and we already discussed that you don't read every paper that comes across your desk from beginning to end, right? That, then you would be doing this uh, for years before you can uh, start getting your own research going. Um, so we're going to talk about how, how do you process these kinds of papers. The example we're going to use is the force rate paper. Um, 
this was a, a, a paper we published successfully uh, a couple of years ago um, on extending thumb read via force input. Um, and um, I'm going to go through and uh, show you guys where on each section of this paper you find the contribution, where there's stuff related to the benefits, where there's stuff related to novelty, like where we show that it's different from other work, um, where we talk about the validity of our work, where we show that our research was valid, uh, where we talk about the applicability of it for the, uh, you know, for the community, and where we pay it particular uh, attention to, to formatting and presenting our work in, in easy to read and easy to uh, process ways um, from the presentation point of view. So starting uh, with this, the first thing you typically come across is um, the, the title, right? I mean, that's what you find in the ATM Digital Library or wherever you're searching Google Scholar, you find just the title. So titles are super important to formulate well. Um, ideally, just reading the title already gives you a pretty good idea what the paper is about. Um, and so what we did here is something that um, isn't always done in our field, but uh, other research fields actually, um, for example, in biology and, 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 and so on, I find this is used a lot. The idea is that the title is actually a sentence already short sentence that says the main thing. The main contribution basically is in the title. Right? So you can see here, extending some breach via force input stabilizes device grip for mobile touch control. Right? So uh, that gives you a contribution and it also will uh, talk about something uh, novel here. We've marked this with novelty because uh, the question of how do you make sure that people don't drop their phone when they're you know, re-gripping it to, to reach an area on the screen? That actually hasn't been looked at much, so that's just part of the, the novelty. But the whole sentence is basically our key um, contribution. And um, as you can see here, this is uh, how the paper typically, uh, many papers start with a figure one, uh, kind of like a, a teaser picture that gives an at-a-glance visual overview of what the paper is about. Um, very important to design that well as uh, too. So just by looking at figure one, you can see what happens here. Uh, over time, you touch lightly, and once you extend a certain touch, uh, uh, force touch threshold, so beyond certain passing, right, um, this little thing appears, which you can then move around with your thumb. Uh, pressing harder moves this little dot out further, um, as we indicate with these little markers here. And then when you've uh, reached the area the one is wanted to reach, like the select all button here in the top left, you suddenly let go and the sudden decrease in, in touch means that it's then uh, this gets, uh, this button gets pushed and as a result all the photos get selected here in this example. Um, the caption of each diagram is also super important. My secret sauce recipe for captions is you gotta have two things in there. You have to have in there what is it that I am looking at, so you need to explain the image to the reader, and then what is it that I'm supposed to take away from this? Why are you showing me this image? What is the key message I'm supposed to take away? You'll be surprised how many people don't do this in their captions from their, of their figures. Uh, but if you do those two things, um, then you typically get a, uh, you know, you get people to understand your figures well, and that's an important way to contribute or to, to communicate your contribution, okay, especially in the first figure. So moving on, when you uh, see a paper, you've seen the uh, you've seen the uh, the title, you downloaded the paper, or you're looking at the abstract in the first page of the paper, um, you'll probably see this figure one. That's often something you you glance at, maybe read the caption, and if the paper was written well, you already now have an idea of what's going on. Right? Um, then you can move on and, and read the abstract, right? Uh, so what's hiding in the abstract? You can ignore this stuff, right? That's just copyright blurb. Uh, and this you can ignore also. This is just telling you how this paper should be cited if you cite it yourself. So you can see this was published at CHI 2019, um, and it has the DOI uh, link here, which is standard these days as well. Um, but the abstract itself is, you know, this like 150 words maybe, uh, short, sentence, uh, short section that should tell you everything about the paper that you need to know to get a first idea of what it is about. 
again, contribution um, is in there. So what does Forcer contribute? It contributes like Forceway lets users aim at an out of reach target by applying force, a force touch um, at a comfortable time location, casting a virtual ray towards the target. Um, and we talk about the novelty here um, and how that different, uh, differentiates itself from related work. It was, uh, um, it had a slightly less, uh, worse performance than the best existing technique, bezel cursor, but it caused significantly less um, grip changes. Um, and so that's, well, that was the key claim here in, in Forza. Next up, uh, you then have a couple of keywords, and you know, these are mostly used for, for search. Once you've opened the paper, you hardly uh, usually look at them much. Um, and we get to like the first page, right? Introduction, right? That's always how these papers start. Uh, and the introduction typically encodes quite a few things. It should encode um, why, you know, why the problem that we're looking at is important. So it should motivate the reader why this research is important. Um, and um, I like the idea of thinking of the the introduction as a as a, a friend once put it um, as sort of the shortest path from a general understanding of the area to the problem that the paper addresses. Um, so uh, here we're giving people an idea of what this paper um, is, is about, what, what the current problem is that we're addressing. Um, we're talking about explicitly uh, what, um, you know, what the benefits are like natural ergonomic thumb movement um, and a stable device grip, et cetera. Um, and a fast selection of targets at screen borders by just applying lots of force to it. Um, and so then we actually say, thus the key contribution of this paper is the interaction technique that extends thumb breach via force input to enable selection of out of reach targets with a steady device grip, right? And this is so helpful for the reader, for the reviewer to know actually, okay, that's what this paper is mainly about. Um, and we have a couple other things in there. The way that many authors, not everybody, many authors, and, and including us, structures their papers is that usually at the end of the introduction, we summarize the contributions that we made for the reader, and we tell them what to expect in the rest of the paper, in the remainder of this paper. And then we come basically in a, a preview of what's coming, right? We review related work, then we describe the design and implementation of the, the phosphor technique, then we present two user studies for validation, um, uh, blah, 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 uh, the, and, and then we briefly summarize the key findings from those results already here, and then we say that our paper closes with recommendations to address reachability issues for one-handed touch tool use. So we say then, this is when you want to use force rate, this is when you want to use another technique. Right? So design recommendations are also often um, a uh, closing remark. Next up then, we get into the related work section. And guess what, related work, of course, is largely um, about novelty, right, obviously. Uh, so a lot of the related work will cover, uh, often related work is divided up into different aspects, right? So here, for example, we talk about all the different techniques that have been proposed for reachability on smartphones, because there are quite a few. And then we have a second section here uh, on various ways of using force input on, on uh, devices. Um, and so that basically gives you a summary of why, of what um, is out there. And as you can see, we've got lots of references to other papers. Um, so here's an example. I'm just going to read one sentence here. 2D Dragger, citation 44, solves this problem by stepping through UI elements by tiny swipe gesture. So that's giving you the key contribution of that paper. Which, however, the sentence continues, is tedious and time consuming. So we also say why we think that's not the end of what needs to be done. That's why we still need to do our own work to improve on the uh, results of that other uh, paper. And that's usually how re related work is presented. Um, then we have um, uh, a bit about the contribution, right? The force ray interaction technique gets described here. Um, and, um, and we talk about the benefits, like three key benefits, scalability, efficiency, and visibility. I don't need to go into details about this, uh, but that's, again, trying to explain what the benefits of our technique are for people using this, uh, researchers or practitioners. Next up comes a section um, that, you know, we've now basically introduced the new thing, and now we're going to evaluate it. 
um, that's the second half of the paper. Um, and that's the first study here. Study one, reachability techniques, right? And here we have a typical breakdown. We describe what our uh, setup looked like, and you know, what kind of tasks, what kind of user groups we, uh, the demographics of our users. Um, we talk about the um, different techniques that we tested because we actually went ahead and we implemented uh, existing techniques that had been published previously and tested them against our own. Um, so we got MaxDig and Bezel Curse and Force Ray and, and one handed mode um, here to, to test with. And then we talk about the um, uh, the targets that people had to select, um, how they were distributed across the screen, and about the variables, independent variables uh, and the dependent variables. So it's really, you know, you guys could read this and you would you would know your way around what we're talking about here. Right? So we're really trying to make it easy for the reader to pick up what's going on. And, and this is a whole mix of things. Most of it, of course, is about validity because that's the study section here, right? Um, but also, uh, we try to outline here, again, the related work is, is recapped here and the techniques that we found in related work are described in a little more detail so that you can see how our technique differs from them. So it's a novelty aspect. Um, and here's an, a nice example of a, another figure that was introduced by us um, to show how the, dis the targets that you know were the numbered uh, uh, squares here and the distractors or the other squares were being arranged on a, on a grid. Um, so it gives people an idea of how our study actually looked. Right? That's important. Um, for the, the reader to understand it. Let's say somebody else wanted to, as you said, you know, um, um, being able to verify and, and re-implement uh, something and, and um, replicate results is important. For that, you would have to know these kinds of things. Like how was the study actually conducted? Right. Then we get to the results, right? So we could describe the study. Now we get to the results. Um, that's where lots of graphs and tables usually hit you and lots of statistics hit you. Um, and so, of course, um, a lot of that is um, basically the, uh, the key contribution, if you like, like this uh, uh, dark yellowish area here. Um, and, and this part talks about significant effects that, for example, grip change had a significant effect on uh, the technique, right? meaning we, have, we are now talking about the statistical connections between the independent and dependent uh, variables that we've introduced earlier. Um, technique had a significant main effect on time. Right? We talk about what that means, and we talk about the tests we did, uh, the, statistic, the statistical tests. Here you can also see interaction effects, for example, technique uh, with the target, two independent variables, had an interaction technique, uh, had an interaction effect. Um, so we have these multivariable um, effects that we also talk about here. Then, of course, you know, the graphs are trying to illustrate uh, what people uh, you know, make it easier to, to process all this, all these, you know, these um, deserts of data that we have here. Um, and just to give you an example, um, let's take maybe um, this this figure five text here that says, okay, what we're looking at something from study one, uh, the rotation in degrees for the x, y, and and z axis. Uh, between these different techniques. So it says, how much did the phone get moved around while you were doing the technique? How much did you have to, to handle it? Um, less handling, better, being better, obviously. Uh, and so for, uh, we then say that, okay, so we've, we've marked which ones are significantly different um, with P uh, less than 0 0.001 and with the confidence intervals. We're gonna talk about that next week. Uh, and then here's the key thing that people are supposed to take away from this. FR, fourth way, caused almost no device movement. You can't read this from back there, but you see there's lots of fairly high graph, uh, high bar, and there's a really low one, and that's always force ray as a technique. So you can see among all the techniques that we had, it caused by far the least um, device uh, movement while the technique was being executed. So that goes back to my thing about how do you write good captions, right? Um, so results are usually not debatable. Right, results, if your statistics are correct, if your internal validity is robust, um, the results are what they are. Now we get to the discussion where you take the results and you try to make sense of them. And that's super important for the reader because you as the author probably have a lot of insight. You've thought about this a lot. You have ideas why certain variables might have influenced others. But this stuff is to a certain degree open to debate. Right? This is interpretation of the data. 
So that's why this is called often the discussion section. It comes after the results and is often separated out. Results, nothing to argue about, hopefully. We don't make mistakes. But the discussion, that's where you start leaning out of the window a little and saying, like, I think this is going on here. Right? Um, and so that obviously then has uh, sections on, um, uh, on the novelty of what we have been doing here. It has sections on the on, or, or most of the benefit, I think, is, is what you see here. Um, and also, of course, um, summarizing again the contributions, taking all the data into account, uh, blah, blah, blah. We found um, bezel cursive being the fastest, the most accurate. Uh, however, success was not significantly better and then Forster and Forster caused the least and almost no device motion that was significantly different from all other tested techniques. Um, so um, that's where we, so we summarize these things. You also, of course, um, get some uh, smaller references here that, that you know, try to pull out the results again from our res uh, result section and discuss them um, uh, in, in the following. And then there's something else that you sometimes see in, in papers that have these kinds of study results where we say like, huh, if let's say you're a practitioner, you're designing an app and you're thinking about how should I do the reachability thing on, on the smartphone app. Um, then you might want to have some guidelines, right? Not just the, the statistical results. You want to know what should I do as a designer, as a practitioner, uh, when I'm facing a certain design situation? How does this research help me? So that's what we're doing here in this last section. Based on what we've learned from uh, our studies, we give recommendations for the tested techniques for different uh, criteria and context. So if people need to be super fast, for example, in selecting things and device script doesn't matter, uh, then use this technique. If you're worried about people dropping their phone, let's say it's you know, used on an oil platform with the North Sea beneath you, people really shouldn't be dropping their phone, right? Then you might want to go for a fourth ray, for example, because it's, it has a very secure grip while you're interacting with it. Um, so you know those kinds of things we, we put into this paper. Uh, so that's another um, addition to um, what we give uh, people in terms of the, uh, the contribution. All right. so. <clears throat> That concludes this paper, and, and this was distributed over, you know, uh, I don't know, eight or so uh, pages. Um, and uh, as you can see from this, it's not that there is like one section that only talks about the contribution and one that talks only about the benefits and so on. It is distributed through the paper, but there are usually patterns that you will learn to discover, right? You will usually see that, of course, the related work will tell me whether what they are doing is actually novel or whether it is only a minor variant of what has already been done, hopefully. Um, and uh, oftentimes you'll find that you don't need to go through all the detailed uh, statistics unless you decide, oh, this is really important work. I want to build on this. I want to make super sure that this is actually all solid and, and OK. Because the assumption is this paper has been reviewed, right? It's been, it has been accepted by the, the peer community. So hopefully there are no glaring mistakes. And that's, again, how research works, so that you don't have to go through and verify this paper from beginning to end if it comes from a reputable source. Now, there are conferences that will take pretty much any paper and then will make you pay for actually publishing the paper and weird setups there. Um, but you know, the, the more respected conferences, like the ones that ACM typically uh, pays for or, or, or co-sponsors in our field, um, or IEEE uh, co-sponsors are usually um, okay with that. And if you want to know about the, you know, the respectability of a conference or, or journal, then you can usually look at, at their impact. Like how much do the works that are published here actually impact the field? And there's listings that you can find through Google Scholar and others that will tell you what venues are um, typically fairly respectful, uh, respectable. Um, you can also tell some of that by the acceptance rates. You know, conference has a low acceptance rate, like high, somewhere around 25% um, of the papers make it in, uh, three quarters get rejected. Uh, then that tells you a little bit about like the selection process. Right? Talking about the selection process, that's the last uh, uh, piece that I want to talk uh, to you guys about today. Um, this is based on, again, on the guide to reviewing papers that changes a little bit. Uh, and, and Kai also changes this process a little bit each year, but the fundamental principles remain um, the same. 
so let's say, for example, um, I was a I, I was an associate chair last year for Kai, which means that I had about fifteen or so papers that I was managing uh, that I had to read myself, but that I also had to, for some of them, for half of them, I had to find reviewers, um, two external reviewers that were just reviewing that one paper particularly for me. Uh, and then I had to read all the, through all these reviews um, and had to make up my own mind on like where, whether I thought the paper was acceptable or not. And you usually have a colleague who's also in a similar role. Um, and um, then you know, between all these involved parties, there's online discussion after everybody's written a review. Um, and ultimately, the paper gets in or, or does not get in. Sometimes there are ways to re-submit um, your paper. At some you know, the form of conferences let you uh, resubmit your paper, making some changes uh, based on the feedback. So if they say, ah, really, don't bother, right? This is not, there's nothing in there that I think is, is, is worth um, you know, resubmitting, then you'll hear that. Otherwise, they might say, you need to change the following things, and then you cut your chances. Um, it depends on the context. But how does a review actually look? So if um, once you've written a few papers, um, you're invited usually to start reviewing papers too because then you know, the community can assume that you kind of know what this is about and that you know what kind of quality uh, we're looking for in, in HI research papers. And a typical review looks like this. The first thing is something that is a super helpful exercise uh, it goes back to the contributions and benefits statement that we talked about. Um, when you do active reading of papers, when you try to go through a large bunch of papers and make sense of each research contribution, uh, a good way to do that is to write your own little summary. Like, what are they actually doing? You'd be surprised how often you're like, huh, I actually don't know. I, I thought I'd read this paper, but I've kind of, you know, my eyes glazed over halfway through, and I don't actually know exactly what they've done. So, Going through and trying to formulate for your own, uh, for yourself, um, what this paper is about, uh, what is this paper presents the following thing, uh, and um, the following you know uh, application areas that benefit from the results um, of the study or technique or toolkit or whatever it is. Uh, so that helps. That's why most review forms will ask you to start with that. Right? Just it's kind of a it's it's a safety. Uh, mechanism too to make sure that the reviewer has actually read the paper right, before they uh, voice their opinion about it. Um, and then comes, uh, you know, what do you think about the novelty, the validity of this paper, and and how it is being presented right? um, with the cr criteria that we've just talked about. So nothing too um, surprising here. And then you typically get things like uh, suggestions for improvement. Now. Uh, this is surprisingly hard as a reviewer because it's easy to criticize and say like, oh, I don't think the application examples are convincing. You know? and you're like, yeah, okay, I can say that. That's a valid comment. But if you get that as an author, you're like, okay, so you don't like my application examples. What would you have liked, right? Do you have an idea? And so that's where sometimes a good reviewer will become almost like a, you know, a mentor or co-author in a way, not formally, but um, will help the authors to actually improve their paper with constructive advice, right? saying, um, your application examples are great, but they're all in the area of, I don't know, um, usage in academic context. Why not include an example of an industrial use case or something? So that's so much more helpful for the author, and they come back, oh, yeah, good idea, or you know, they, can, they can follow that. And, and do something with the feedback. So suggestions for improvement require much more brain juice from the reviewer, but are, of course, the hallmark of a, of a great review. Um, and then typically there is a, an overall rating that is given to these papers um, between you know, definite reject and definite accept. Um, again, this changes from year to year slightly and from conference to conference, but <coughs> The overall idea is often that uh, the papers that make it into a good conference are the ones where you actually have reviewers that actively argue for accepting this paper. And I like this formulation that people say, like, if you give it a five, it means that you would stand up if there was, you know, an in-person meeting uh, 
program committee meeting, he was saying, I'm saying like, I think this paper should get in because, you know, you'd be a champion for this paper. Um, but the four, you would still, you know, argue for it, but maybe not that enthusiastically, right? Uh, and you would be okay with it not getting in. And a three is kind of like, I'm sitting on the fence, I can't make up my mind, kind of not very helpful <laughs> oftentimes. Uh, whereas the two and the one are similarly, like one says like this paper cannot make it in this, the following clause, and I will argue strongly, I will put myself on the line saying like this paper cannot get in because. Uh, whereas the two says like, eh, there's some chance it might get in, but I think I would probably argue against it. So you, you can see that in the end what you're expressing there is your own, uh, you know, uh, personal opinion of whether that paper should make it in. Of course you shouldn't just be, uh, subjective without any proof of this, you know, your review obviously needs to back up what you're saying about the paper as well. And then finally, um, oftentimes reviews will ask, uh, what's your experience? Have you just published, you know, papers in this exact same field? Like, is your work maybe even cited by the author? Um, then that means that you're likely an expert in the field, you know the work, but this is especially important if as a reviewer you're supposed to judge whether the work is original, then you kind of need to know the field. Right? Otherwise, you need to do all that research uh, from scratch, and that's a lot of work. So typically, you get you know people who are either experts in the field or who are fairly knowledgeable in the field. Uh, below that, you should usually not get. Although sometimes it can be useful to have somebody in there who says, yeah, I'm an HGI researcher, and this paper is going to get published at CHI. Um, I should at least be able to make sense of it, right? even if I'm not in that particular field. It gives you maybe a little bit of a different perspective um, uh, than somebody who is very in tune with the with that research uh, thread, particularly. So um, there's an, a, a nice book uh, by Zobel, Writing for Computer Science. This is not yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering how the papers are distributed to the reviewers. So you said that the um, yeah. reviewers are yeah. also like expert in the domain and. I can imagine that you, as, as well, when writing a paper, you know all the experts, maybe in person, so maybe there are different forms and colleagues, and this is like a yeah. thing that a friend of you like, reads and reads Yeah, 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 so a lot to unpack there, a really good question. Um, and that's something the community worries about a lot, right, because this, this process is fragile and, and, and difficult to keep fair and, and, and at a high quality. Getting good quality reviews is important, just as good quality papers is important. So there's a couple things in place. First of all, um, that's also something that will help you judge the quality of a conference or a journal, um, whether the process is, is a double blind review. Meaning that in respected conferences like Kai, for example, the authors won't know who the reviewers are and the reviewers will not know who the authors are. So when you submit your paper, you're actually removing your name from the paper. Right? So you send in a version of your paper that doesn't have author names or affiliations. Um, however, the coordinator of your paper, primary associate chair, 1AC they're often called, uh, will know who you are because he then needs to find reviewers for your paper. So he needs to make sure that he picks people who are not from your university. So he will read your paper and let's say it's about, you know, this force ray thing, right? Uh, and then he will say, okay, so force ray, force ray. So there's force touch mobile input devices. Let me see here. Hopefully the one AC is an expert in this field, so knows a bit about the related work. So he will look for people from other universities, for example, other research labs across the world who have also worked in this field recently, uh, who published in this field, who are experienced, hopefully you know, beyond the PhD stage. Um, so with a little bit of experience on their belt, a couple of papers published themselves, and ask them, hey, here's a paper on a topic that is very related for, to what you just published last year. Would you like to review it? Chances are that actually the, the submitted paper even cites this other person. So what I do when I get a paper that I need to find reviewers for is I do go through the related work section and introduction, where usually you find all the references to related work from other people. And then I look for references that they come up. I look at the back, okay, 
what year was that reference being written, what lab is this, is it the same lab as the one that submitted this new paper, which could be a case, right? People often self-reference their earlier work, totally fine. Um, so, and if I find something there, then that's a candidate for a reviewer that I might want to invite. I say, hey, look, these guys cite your work from last year, so you know, it must be highly relevant, um, and so we want to review. So that makes sure that the reviewer now doesn't know who the authors are, but I know as a coordinator, as the one AC, I know that there's no conflict uh, between these two because they're from the same field. Um, was there another question? Yeah, no, so in theory, you could have like you had friends somewhere on the other end of the world and you talk to them about. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, good, good question. Yeah, so, so when you are invited as a reviewer, um, let's say I invite somebody from the University of San Diego, right? And, but it happens that you guys are best friends, right? And, and you've maybe worked together, you've published together in the past, which could be the case. Uh, I may not know that, right? so I invite this other person. So it's this other person's responsibility to say, oh, that work, uh, first of all, every reviewer has to mark their conflicts of interest anyway. They have to say, I am conflicted with, you know, the University of San Diego, this guy would say. Anybody from the University of San Diego, I can't review their work, right? But if they've published previously with other people like you, they would also have to list that ahead of time. So they would say, I'm also conflicted with the following researchers. Right? And so then uh, he wouldn't even make it on my list. I would, pick, as I pick him as a reviewer, um, I go through the database, every reviewer registers himself in the database, and then I can see, oh, okay, so that person actually has a conflict with you as my reviewer. But in the end, not all conflicts can be caught that way. Um, and if the reviewer recognizes the work as something from a lab that is very likely, you know, you, and he doesn't have your name, right, but if he recognizes it, uh, he would have to self-declare the conflict of interest. Right? Conflict of interest means if there is any way that you're just, you know, you might be tempted to do somebody else a personal favor or be evil to somebody else because there's a deep, you know, long-standing animosity, you should not be a reviewer. Uh, and the external measurements that are easy to verify are shared publications over the last typically three to five years, typically what people use for this. Uh, that kind of takes you out of the reviewer pool for that publication. Um, or shared uh, institutions, right? So if he's an out of the Austin person, you're an out of the Austin person, you, you would not be in the reviewer pool. Anything else? No, okay, okay good. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. That, that's, yeah, we worry about this a lot. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's, it's not HCI, but it is, is the way to keep this research uh, engine running. Uh, Paul, did you have a question? Yes. Um, isn't there also a conflict if you review a paper that you are cited in because if you reject it, you lose one citation and researchers <laughs> want to be cited? That's a good one. Um, it's not considered a conflict. Um, yes, if the paper gets rejected, I lose a citation. Um, but I think the, so the expectation is that researchers stand above that level of, of bean counting. Um, but, but you're right, of course. Um, that, that, is a, that can be an issue. So what's actually interesting is that uh, recently, a couple of years ago now, uh, Kai, for example, has started to actually let the authors suggest reviewers. And so if you take care and uh, you think about who could be reviewing this paper, who is somebody who knows this field, because you as the author probably know the field very well, right? So you could say this person has done, you know, is the most related work to this. Like for example, let's take the force rate paper, right? The closest competitor here was clearly Bessel Cursor. Um, uh, that was done by Anne Rudeau, uh, and, and she was from a different lab. We hadn't published together. So we would have suggested her as a reviewer, right? Because she can judge this work very clearly uh, we're comparing to her work you know, throughout our, um, our paper. And so that would be a great review for this paper. Could give it a fair judgment, right? a fair review. Yeah, so um, the checklist for, for reviews, just uh, quickly. If you recommend accept, then you need to make sure the paper doesn't have any serious defects, right? So the, the validity needs to be there. Um, you need to verify the roughly that statistics are sound. 
they didn't pick the wrong method or something like that. Um, you need to convince the editor or the, the primary AC, the one AC, that the standard is acceptable, explaining in your review why it's original, why it is valid, and why it is well presented. Um, you list any changes that you think should still be done before it's printed, and where possible, ideally you don't just suggest that there is something to change, but you actually say what the change should, should be, right? Um, that's what about the constructive um, criticism that I mentioned earlier. And you take reasonable care in checking details like math, formula, bibliography, stuff like that. So you're not expected to you know, spend a week uh, verifying every single citation by hand, uh, but you know, a reasonable look over, uh, over these things is expected. Uh, and if you reject, then you need to explain clearly what the faults are and, and ideally discuss how they could be rectified, which is much harder than just pointing out things. Um, indicate still which parts are valuable and should and which ones maybe can go. Right? Sometimes people um, you know, publish a paper that has lots of contributions in there and some things are not that interesting, but other things are really uh, important and should be kept. Um, check the paper to a reasonable level of detail is, is still the thing. And either way, whether you're rejecting or, uh, or accepting, you always uh, do the following. You basically provide uh, additional references. This is a, a frequent thing to do where you say, um, this is something that the author should be familiar with um, if they've missed a reference, for example. Right? Uh, sometimes that's just to give people more context that they can discuss. Sometimes it's actually part of an argument why this paper may get rejected because it missed a crucial reference that is actually very close to what they did. Um, you ask yourself, and <laughs> this is hard, uh, you ask yourself, you know, reading your own review, whether that is actually a review you would enjoy getting as an author, right? So um, you can say factually the same things in your review, but you can say it in very different tone of voice and in a very, you can do this in an encouraging way saying that these are the things I really liked about this paper, that stuff should be kept and should become a part of future contribution. This is why I think the paper isn't ready for publication at this time. Here are suggestions on how to get there, right? That's a friendly, positive, constructive tone uh, and um, but you can also be much more devastating about it. Never read any rubbish like this. Blah blah blah. Actually, sometimes, you know, very very rarely, uh, we do see reviews like this. And typically, these get caught because the reviewers write their review, but then the coordinator, the editor, or the one AC, you know, gets to read these reviews before they get sent out to authors. And then they can talk to the review and say, like, hey, you know, you could be a little friendlier there. You know, pay a bit more attention to your review. Um, and you also are expected to be honest about like what kind of limitations you have dealt yourself. Like if you are not familiar with a particular technology that they're using or something like this or a method, then you should say so. Um, and in the end, it's a good idea to check your review as carefully as you would check one of your own uh, papers prior to submission. Um, in the interest of time, Marcel, I would actually suggest we have a sample um, uh, review here of a fourth ray in here. Uh, I would skip that for now, and maybe you can go over that uh, in, in one of the lab sessions, if that's all right. Yeah? Okay. Um, because that is just going to show you a sample review of Fourth Ray, uh, which actually is, is, uh, has criticism in there, but in the end, the paper got, got accepted anyway, so it's an interesting read. Um, and that's all um, that you guys need to see for class. I'm going to jump ahead beyond this and just talk about what's going to happen next. Um, so uh, this is where we are right now. Um, so your your current milestone, um, where you're uh, picking a research topic, is the deadline is today. Um, so make sure that you have that uh, in there, based on research topic based on the sustainability goals. Uh, the next milestone M2 is coming up, where you need to create a plan on how you're going to do your research, like this study protocol. Like what are you going to be doing as that? And that deadline is. Uh, June 6th at uh, 6 p.m. Um, so that is coming up. And um, I think we can also uh, talk about next week's lecture real quick. That's going to be quantitative qualitative analysis. So we're going to dig down into uh, a bunch of statistics and methods uh, that are important. So make sure to complete your milestone by 6 o'clock tonight. Um, and that should get you well, anyway, and we're going to have probably, let's see here, 
Adrian is going to step in, right, um, for uh, the next class when Marcel is away. Uh, just be aware, uh, aware as another person is going to be covering the lab sections. Oh, yeah, Adrian and Sarah, thank you. Um, okay, so that's it. Thanks, everybody, for listening and being here today. See you again next time. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.